Theorem 2.3, limits of polynomial and rational functions. Just a little matching to go on here. P is a polynomial function. C is any real number. So with, with just that bit of information right here, P is a polynomial function. When we take the limit, what will we be able to do? Because we call this function well-behaved. Okay, so we've got, we know that. And that's why we can say the limit of P of X as X approaches C is equal to P of C. If R is a rational function given by, now which of those items down there would fit in that space? Yeah, should be r of x equals, or r of x equals p of x divided by q of x, because that is, in fact, a rational function. Rational functions, you know, uh, the first four or five letters is ratio, which is then a fraction, okay? And c is a real number such that, we have to say, well, if this is a rational number, we have to make sure that our denominator does not equal zero. So such that q of x does not equal zero. Then our conclusion is take a look at that. Anything new in that? because we've used direct substitution, okay? So we're saying that if we have um, rational functions, we can use direct substitution. That's what the conclusion of this theorem is saying. So we've got those basic limits. You know, if we have a constant function or if we have um, the, the simple linear f of x equals x or if we have um, uh, a power function x to the n power, we can use direct substitution. Um, we have then uh, that if we use a scalar, if we um, add two functions together uh, that each have a limit, uh, we multiply them, uh, we subtract them, and so forth, they have limits. And now we just have that if it's a rational function, it has a limit as long as we do not have a zero denominator. That's the only, so the only thing we have to be careful of. Okay. Well, let's put this into practice here. Rational function? Yeah. Any chance that that denominator could be zero? Not if we let x approach three. Okay. What if we let x approach negative three? Then we got a problem. Okay. Then we have a problem. But as long as we're approaching three, okay. So, um, what? How are we going to go about solving this? direct substitution. Okay. I agree. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the inspires just to make sure that we see this because I'm going to be asking you not just to get an answer of one six. That answer is pretty simple. But if I ask you, as I love to do, show me graphical representation of your understanding of the problem. Okay, what would you do 
to graphically show me you understand. Because again, we're going to get into the stuff where all you're going to do is just start putting numbers in and getting an answer. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, I don't know what I just did, but I got a right answer. I don't want that. Okay? I want you to know what it is you've got when you've got a right answer. So, graphically, what will we do for this problem? And I think for this, I'm going to do a uh, new page because I've got a whole new problem I'm working on here. I think I'll probably start with my calculator page. Okay, so I'm going to let you show me. Okay, uh, a couple ways we can do this. We could um, define um, f1 of x, and some of you did this, as 2x minus 5, and f2 of x as x plus 3. Okay. We're going then to look at the limit as x approaches 3 of f1 of x divided by f2 of x. Now, if you don't like f1 and f2, just think of f and g, simply f and g. What I am finding on some of your inspires is that we are actually trying to, let's just say we have f3 of x, and we are in the graphing page in the entry line, we're actually putting in something like this. Now, regardless of what I put in here, if I have a function graphing a limit, we go back, what is the limit expressing to us? What is this notation telling us? And this is, this is why I like to give you this, this portion of the uh, question, because I can tell a lot more about what you understand and don't understand by asking this. If, you know, if we don't understand, this is giving us an output value, a single output value. So if we are, if we have like, you know, one six, if I ask them to have this function graph this and, I, and my answer is one six, what am I going to graph? Just a horizontal line, okay? So we do not want to, we don't want that Instead, what we're wanting to do, oops, undo that. What we're wanting to do is to instead, we want to say f3 of x equals f1 of x divided by f2 of x. That is doing the same thing as this piece right here. Now, what you're going to indicate on your graph is understanding of what the limit as x approaches 3 means. Okay, so again, if we're, if we're struggling with this, we have to go back to the basic idea of a limit. The limit is what's happening to the output values. That's a single value. The outputs are going to or are approaching this one value, so we don't want to graph that one value. If we take a look at these, can you in the back, can you see that okay? Okay. Uh, if we take a look at these, uh, there are some of these that uh, I think we can talk about. Uh, some of these are very similar. This one, I'm not sure what happened to the other piece. I'd have to take a look at the, maybe the uh, window to see what happened. Maybe this person uh, just used... Um, just used a smaller window and that's why they didn't get it because we should see this. Okay, now one of you I said, um, you had the graph and you had a point on the graph but it didn't tell me anything else so I need to know more information. Uh, it's, I don't expect you to do anything of animation or whatever, that would be way beyond what I expect anyone to do because I'm not sure that when, you, when I take these files from you on a test or a quiz, I would actually see the animation going. But, um, but the fact that you've got this as we, as you have a point there where the input is 3 and the output is 0.17, how does that indicate the answer of one sixth? Well, we would hope, right? 
that 1.6 converts into, but does it convert into 0.17? Or did that by chance get rounded to two decimal places? Okay, so what would you what would you want to express to me on your paper on a test or a quiz to let me know that you understand that? Well, you might do something like this. That's approximately, am I correct, that is 0.17? I don't have that number in my head, but it sounds familiar. Okay. And uh, you would then be able to show, show me that you understand that there's a point on the curve where the input has that. Now, what if that value does not exist? What then would you do with that point? The limit exists, but the point doesn't. You'd have to do what? Yeah, and if you can't do that on the Inspire, it's okay. It truly is okay. You don't have to use the Inspire. But you do have to show me on your paper the same information. And so you'd have to do an open circle. Remember how we do an open circle? Go into Menu, go to uh, Actions, and go down to Attributes. Okay, if you need a little review of that. Um, by the way, there's, um, there's some great tutorials. I've sent some of you to those tutorials that I'll try and get to the, uh, the URL um, and to everyone through the email. Okay. Um, so what, we do, what I would suggest, what I would deem as appropriate, um, uh, correctly expressed work, I would take, um, I wouldn't take this one because the open circle means the point does not exist. The point does exist, so the open circle would be incorrect on that. So we want the, the, uh, the closed circle. Um, you know, this was good. This is good. Someone inserted a table. So if you wanted to do that, I would, you know, I would understand that then. You can also do that on your paper. Now I talked to, um, to Nash, and I'll just go ahead and say it was Nash, that, and some of you might want to do this too. Pardon? Yeah, I can talk about you? Yeah. Okay. So is this you? Is that what your calculate, your Inspire says right now? Yeah, I'm the outside Well, no, no, no. I don't mean that at all. I mean the fact that you have a scratch pad up. Oh, yeah. Okay, we were talking. I know I'm not paying attention to what you have there. I'm just talking about if you have a scratch pad, remember what I told you about how you have to save it to the document? Yeah. Can you walk us through that? So he's going to move the cursor. Or I'll tell you what, I'm going to make you the presenter. And then you can show us. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's you. Okay. So as, as you move the... Actually, that's not you. This is someone who has a gray one. Sorry, Nash, I thought that was you. Someone who has the gray one that has this on their screen. Okay, good. Okay. So maybe I want you, what I want you to do, I want you to move your... Now, on this one, um, you don't have... You can't move the cursor up there, so I'm going to ask you to press tab. Oh, that didn't work. Uh, we need to get up here. Press tab again. Are you pressing tab? No, um, press the down arrow. Press enter. Oh, that didn't work. Um, I'm trying to get us up here. I gotta remember, uh, press control um, something. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. What? Press the something button. I don't know. We have to put one on there. Press the control something. Um, so I, I, I have to go back and find out how we do that. It's not that hard. I just have forgotten the keystrokes. It's probably control tab. Try control tab. Uh, try um, uh, control up. Okay, we'll find it. We'll find it for those of you who have it. But anyways, you have to save this. And that menu pulls down, and you, it says save to document. So it's somewhere. Uh, press menu. Press menu. Oh, that didn't work either. Okay, forget it. Is it control home? We did something with control home. Go back to current. Number four. Just press numeral four. There we go. Okay, well, um, go home. Don't get up and leave, though. Oops, i got to watch my time here. Okay. Always, 